tonight to the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy at chapter 32. This chapter has to do with the last sermon God's man Moses preached upon the occasion of the second giving of the law. <clears throat> Deuteronomy, the second Namus law, the second giving of the law. And I want to seize upon just two verses of scripture out of this sermon for the message tonight, verses 35 and 36. I believe these two verses could be preached, three messages from them, according to your theology. I want to pick out one of them. I believe that you could take these verses, this chapter, and especially these two verses, bring a message of how God shall deliver his elect nation, the Jews, in the future. If that doesn't fit your theology, I believe these scriptures give us the recipe for how God shall purge, deliver, and revivify his church. But tonight I want to get down to the individual. I believe in these two verses we have the answer to the question, when is a man saved? When is a man saved? God says through his servant here in verse 35 to me belongeth vengeance and recompense their foot shall slide in due time for the day of their calamity is at hand and the things that shall come upon them make haste for the Lord shall judge his people. And I believe you'll get the meaning of that a little nearer to what the scripture actually is trying to say if you rub out the word judge and put the word deliver. For the Lord shall deliver his people. And the only way on earth the Lord's ever been able to deliver his people, a nation, an individual, a church, a movement, the only way God knows to deliver anything or anybody is by judging it. We're professing Christian world is, of course, deeply divided over the teaching of the Word of God about what's going to take place in the last days. I am a, such a novice on that big word eschatology that I don't touch it much, but there is one thing about the interpretation of the return of the Lord that the people who call themselves premillenarian, as you're aware of the different kinds of them, but it seems to me the heart of that interpretation is true in this respect, that God will bring things to a crisis. K-R-I-S-I-S is the Greek word that God delivers and saves not by 
a gradual process but by crisis. In that sense, I think the scriptures speak here. I think that it's almost a forgotten note today that God's judgments, God's judgments come from the hand of a God of all grace. And we would have to completely change our whole thinking today for the greatest need of theology today is a restudy of man. What kind of an animal is man? Is he to be pitied or is he willful? Did somebody push him in the ditch he finds himself in now, he dig it and then jump in it himself. Is he a man that is in the hands of an arbitrary despot called God? Is he the kind of an individual that is screaming and searching for the right way? What kind of a person is man? How would even Almighty God have to do and work in order to save men? That's where they study. I believe that man is this kind of a person that if God Almighty doesn't bring him to judgment in this life, to crisis, that he'll have to send him to hell and judge him at the great white throne. Now that's a very pessimistic estimate of us folks, but I believe it's the Bible estimate. For the Lord shall judge He'll deliver by way of judgment his people and repent himself for his servants when he seeth that their power is gone and there is none shut up or left. And the scriptures continue dissertation about how God Almighty has to kill the gods and people trust in and how without apology he identifies himself as being a God who kills and then makes a lie a God who wounds and then heals and then he threatens about his judgment for I lift if I lift up my hand to heaven and say I live forever and if I whet my glittering sword and mine hand take hold on judgment I'll render vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me and I'll make mine arrows drunk with blood and my sword shall devour flesh and that was the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning of revenges upon the enemy it's sight on earth read the Old Testament and get God's estimate of mankind he regards them as being his enemies he regards them as being haters of him. Now, since you were born, the greatest head person here, we have absolutely refused to face the kind of folks we are. And every media, propaganda, and education, and pulpiteering, and everything else built on the doctrine of evolution was 
born in hell. It's in our schools everywhere. And we're getting gooder and gooder all the time. And so we've fitted our gospel. Well, now we've got a God without wrath delivering men by Christ without a cross, kind of men who have no sin. But that isn't the Bible picture. I think these two verses, 35 and 36, I say I think, I don't know, it's my best judgment, I think they say one thing in three different forms of language. But I want to leave them out before you now. When is a man saved? Well, of course, a man is saved in the Bible sense of the term when he's brought under the authority and rule of Jesus Christ. Very willingly serves a new master. He's under new management. We know that. When he is married, can I use that word, Paul did, in a vital union, the Holy Spirit performing the ceremony with the living Lord, who is the Lord, in the sense of being the Son sent by virtue of his blood poured out on a tree. But when do men come to that place of willing, glad surrender to and submission to the Lord Jesus? I believe our scripture tells us when. Not in the order given in the text, but I mention first that a man is saved when it pleases God. When he shall repent himself for his service. Surely the two most miraculous things that have happened in the history of the world thus far are the conversion of Saul of Tarsus and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And both were accomplished by the hand of Almighty God. Did you get it? When's a man going to get saved? When it pleases God. Now, is this fatalism? No, it's the only antidote to the fatalism of this hour. What does this mean? This is holy ground. Maybe we ought not to even talk, just pull off our shoes and pray. But when the pulpit lost this note, and it began to lose it at least 130 years ago in America, then was when the decline. Until now we have salvation by people who made decisions instead of people who become seekers of the Lord. And there is a vast difference here. 
and thus you ring a doorbell and you don't find anybody saying, oh, I'm so glad you came. I just been here in my Bible praying. Maybe somebody come and interpret it for me. You know, America is an apostate nation. Now, if this isn't good, see, I'll just forgive the old man the best I know. As I understand the apostasy of the book of Hebrews, isn't it people have quit going through the motions? Isn't that people have lost their religion? The apostasy of Hebrew, the book of Hebrews, is departing from a living God. And I'll tell you, a fellow that's still got his faith and his belief and his opinions and his doctrine and his creed and his experience, but he has no relationship to a living God, that guy is hard to talk to. But we just well face it now. Either we're going to have to join Brother Rogers, who's telling me tonight that like the Lord going to let him go to India and maybe to Indonesia. I'm fixing to join him if I get my wife to let me go. I'd love to go there and just sit where people are begging God for mercy. Huh? He told me, listen to a man today, this little old two-bit preacher saw 8,000 people pleading for mercy. Just one week's time. Begging God to have mercy on her. Whew. Leave her go with you. Leave her go with you. Nobody is interested in America where everybody has been converted from one to a dozen times. Nobody feels the need for a seeking of the Lord because we just well face it. The gospel of our hour has placed salvation in the hands and at the caprice of men instead of Almighty God. Now if that's what you mean by Calvinism, I'll fight you for it. I won't fight you over your interpretation of the doctrines. You don't know enough about it, and I know less. But this is what we must, if hell freezes over, come back to. Not to prove something, but under God to turn men's attention to the grave. Adventure will a thrice holy God have mercy on me. Now, if the salvation of man is in the hands of the same God of whom Saul of Tarsus will say when it pleased God to reveal his son in or two, I think mean both of them to me. That's the only God the Bible talks about. If I believe that, I come down off for my little profession and decision and my little doctrines and my little creeds and my little experiences and under God, I become a candidate for the mercy of God. And I know that I've got no price to bring to him and no bargain to offer him and no deal to make with him that I'm utterly obnoxious to his mercy. Yes. We can do one two things. We can get back with broken hearts to shutting men up to this. I tell you when God's going to save you. 
when it pleases him. And the God of the Bible says, I will be inquired of. You ain't interested enough to become a candidate. Not much hope for you. How you reckon God could do anything in this rat race we call Christian in America where on Sunday morning in most of the churches they come and get a little shot of religion in the arm sort of help them sleep through the next week not go crazy that's called spiritual fornication in the Bible and that's the medicine Christendom gives people Is there anything on earth you reckon God can do, Brother Rogers, this outfit around here? Us? Get our attention? Because the reason nobody's seeking God ain't nobody heard from him lately. He'll be inquired of. He never has been found except at the end of a supreme search. Amen. Amen. He never has. Wonder whether God's through with us in this country. You got the blues, Brother Barnett? No. I'm just trying to be as honest as I know how. Now, how honest that is. Honey, we going to have to throw our little old nice gospel away. It's not the answer for this religious nation. We're going to have to change our praying. Sure as your foot and a half high. And I honestly believe we're going to have to start praying for God to bring his judgments upon his church. I don't believe we're ever going to listen to him anymore in our lives if he's not good enough and merciful enough to rain his judgments. Let them begin at the house of the Lord. I don't know whether this is heresy or not, but I thought for a while maybe God's going to be merciful and let the communists get us. I think it would be a wonderful thing if communism would take over in America. Might be some people get saved. Don't look like anybody going to get saved until some terrible monster takes charge. The communists killed several hundred thousand people over in Indonesia. Now they're being saved by the thousands. And of course, it just tears my little theology all to pieces, but I've talked to godly missionaries who've seen God raise people from the dead in the last year in Indonesia. Most of my theology went out the back window. And, of course, I know that long since the theology of us fundamentalists ruled God out of the universe and says, now we're getting along fine, don't you interfere. I'm telling you now that nothing short of a supernatural intervention and there'll have to be judgment. It's the only way God ever has intervened, bud. Huh? We all start praying for her. You want your kids to go to hell? Well, be fat like they are now. We better start praying for God in mercy to do something to get the attention of men to whom he's been praying. Hear me, hear me, listen to me, listen to me. Nobody will. When man saved, 
when it pleases God. When it pleases God, I'll be inquired of. When it pleases God, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. When it pleases God, he's rich unto all who call unto him. When it please God, when men and women come down off of their little nest and start falling around like the leper, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me whole. When's a man say, I've been sort of praying and so I won't have nothing to lose much. But maybe God will bring financial bankruptcy on us. That'd be an act of mercy. Now, of course, He wouldn't do nothing like that, you know. Because God's so good, he'd rather let us all go to hell and have a little hard time. Isn't that right? You're looking at a preacher that may be a calamity howler, but in my judgment it isn't. I mean, well, that's worth a dime or not that the only way on earth God could get your attention is mine is to make us hungry for bread. I just don't believe we've heard from God in so long. I don't think we're fixing to pay any attention to him. Whew. And Brother Broughton, I understand you're a big financier now. At least you are dealing with businessmen. And I believe you'll say the old man knows what he's talking about now. But everybody in the business world is deeply conscious of the fact that there isn't even a hair's breadth separating America from bankruptcy right now. That's right. And if you understand the United States policy towards South Africa, where most of the gold that yet hasn't been mined is, and how we just determined to turn them over to Russia. And if Russia ever gets control of the goal of South Africa, if God doesn't intervene, you've got the gold market absolutely controlled by anti-God Russia and anti-Christ Israel. All they got to do is pull the switch. And you lose everything you've got. Wouldn't that be awful? That'd be better than going to hell. Maybe we better bragging on ourselves and wake up to the kind of folks we are. Let me tell you what kind of person you are, honey. If it wasn't for the influence of the gospel and the power of the common grace of God and the restraining power of the Holy Spirit, if you could get into the presence of God now, you'd spit in his face. That kind of folks you are, and me too. That's right. God. Men are going to be saved when it pleases God. If God don't do something to turn men and women into seekers and candidates for his mercy, there's no hope for us. When's a man going to be saved? Well, the same thing in a little different language. 
God's going to save a sinner when God sees that that sinner's power is gone. And there's none shut up or left. I tell you what kind of folks we are. This is all. There ain't no living human being ever going to save if he can help it. That's awful, but so. There's no person ever going to be saved if he can help it. That's the kind of folks we are. Because we don't believe it. We think that we're nice, but God says that our hearts, thing that makes us tick, or cesspools of hostility to Almighty God. We are God haters. That's awful hard. Talking about it. Well, if I get all over this country, I've been for you. I'll be with that fellow preacher. I'll be with that damnable doctrine. Any man that wants to be saved, God will save him. That's fine, but it's silly. Who wants to? Nobody. Nobody. You tried to cram that? Oh, I believe in whosoever will gospel, whosoever will come. Fine. Silly to preach it in the world of whosoever wants. When's the man saved? When he surrenders to Jesus Christ. When's the man surrender to Jesus Christ? He ain't never gonna do it till he's been made a bankrupt spiritually. When God sees that the last wiggle is out. And when God sees that a man has lost all hope in anything he's ever done or ever will do, any power of himself, any strength within himself, then when God will take charge. How's God going to rob you and me of our utter trust in our own ability when he sees that that power is gone and there's none shut up or left? When every refuge is gone, when every avenue of escape has eluded us, When every mouth is stopped, guilty, guilty, guilty. Unless God can make a beggar out of you, rob you of all you trust in you'll never be saved when is a man saved in a little different language say the same thing number three when in the presence of God's judgments as they become real and manifest to his heart that's when a man will be saved let me repeat it not when the judgments of God come to a man but until that man realizes this is the judgment of God to become real and manifest in here. All judgments are figures of hell. They're just previews. Is that the right word for it? 
all that see the judgments of God are not saved. But all that are saved see the judgments of God. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, the light of the horrors of hell must come to men or they'll never see the glory of God in salvation. Until Men become keenly conscious of that total ruin and their total separation in God's time from Almighty God. They'll not be saved. Now this is terrible doctrine for this enlightened age. But we just shall face it. The cross and hell are both just exercises of the sovereignty of God. And they stand and they fall together. Until an individual, but listen to me now, has some sense of what Jesus Christ experienced on that tree, you need to worry about becoming a Christian. Let me explain it. You need the record that God been pleased to leave of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. Read it, read it, read it, read it. Never a cry from the lips of the Lord Jesus until he was utterly forsaken by God Almighty. They whipped him. He didn't cry. Placed crown signs on his head. He didn't cry. Stuck a spear in his side, he didn't cry. They offered him dope, he didn't cry. They said terrible things about his mother, he didn't cry. They sneered at him, made fun of him, tempted him, and mocked him. But you'll never hear. A saving cry out of even him, because he'd been made sin there, folks, and it wasn't a, a play-like thing, it was so. God. 
I hope you'll experience a little of it. I hope God will single you out and rob you of everything until some of the horror of being abandoned by and forsaken by your Creator dawn on your soul. For this is the cry of Emmanuel. This is Emmanuel's orphan cry. This is the awful judgment of God. Oh, to be brought where the horror of being forever forsaken by the one who put breath in you. That's when you're going to be saved. We don't need to be saved very much unless this is so. But if it is the fate of men and women to experience exactly what Jesus Christ experienced on that tree and to experience it throughout eternity, we desperately need to be saved. And you used to argue about whether the little fire in hell, I suppose it is, but it won't hurt much. I'll tell you what will hurt in hell. To be utterly forsaken by Almighty God. And God grant that some of the horror of what it means to be LOST law. When that becomes real to you. I think you'll do one of these things. You'll curse God. Or you'll become a candidate for mercy. A candidate for mercy. I ain't got told it before, but I... I'll tell it again. I was in Decatur, Texas, holding a meeting many years ago. My little baby girl, Patty Sue, took sick. And wife would phone. And I hung on the meeting. And one night while I was preaching, a boy rushed up from outside the tent, came up the pulpit, brought me a message from the telephone, a message by a good man where I lived. He said, tell the preacher, he phoned the message, that he waited as long as he can. If he wants to be home before his baby dies, he must come right now. And I borrowed a fellow's car and rode through the night. And when I got home, the doctor was gone. Nurse was out of the room. My wife was in the room with my little girl. She's sitting on the side of the bed, and I went and sat on the side of the other side. My little girl was nearly dead, but she became conscious that Daddy was in the room. I'm not a doctor. I don't know just exactly how to describe it, but uh, she was hemorrhaging inside and blood vessels were breaking, and she'd lost the power of her speech. She looked at me, and she was a Daddy girl. And 
I could see her lips try to move, and I know what she was saying, I knew it then, she was appealing to her daddy to help her. And I had to sit there and hold my baby in her arm, my arms, and I heard the rattle of death in her throat when her little body jumped while my girl wife sobbed, and I had to sit there and watch my only child die. I would have reached down and rebuked the monster and released my little girl, but I couldn't. One day on a tree outside the holy city of Jerusalem, this is a fact, it actually took place, the only begotten Son of Almighty God, the one we talk about in the scripture is the Son of my love under God he looked up he couldn't say my father because he'd been made sin but he said my God my God help me why hast thou forsaken me And the God who could have released his son from that monster that engulfed him wouldn't. For therein was wrought out the price of my redemption. Redemption from what? Total, final separation throughout eternity from Almighty God. When you're going to be saved, when something of the horrors of what damnation really is become real to you. You'll become a seeker after the Lord. Star heads. Oh, God, tonight.
I don't think there's a spot in the world where people have been worn, fled with, wept over, importuned, to flee the coming wrath of God's holy abandonment more than the people who come to this building. I hope nobody will go on until one day their cry shall be my God, my God. Why hast thou forsaken me? Wouldn't it be awful to go to hell from this preaching place? If you want to be saved, I beg you to scream down this aisle, get on your face and plead God for mercy. Just plead for mercy. While we sing, that's the only invitation I know to give. And let's sing while we stand. I hear the Savior say, Hope you will hear him. If you want to be saved, if you desperately need God's hand of mercy in Jesus Christ, Come and become a candidate. Humble yourself and become a seeker. Cry unto the Lord for his mercy.